Um, we continue. I'm going to tell you something about blockchain and uh, a tiny bit of, uh, about Bitcoin as well. Um, maybe some, some hands that have an, an idea who is, who is actually know what Bitcoin or what blockchain is. Maybe some, some hands to have some, some idea where I, I should. Okay, there's one. That's about it. There's one in the back. Okay, who, who owns Bitcoins? I mean, this, okay, so this, these are more. Okay, who invests in, in ICOs? Okay, and who's uh, from the startup world here today? Okay, and he, who's coming from the corporate side then? I saw some, okay, so mainly corporates. Um, okay, uh, to introduce myself, um, Oliver Nagel, I'm the founder of uh, Blockchain Helix. Um, we're providing digital identities on the blockchain, and I'm also the founder, uh, one of the founders of the Blockchain Association of Germany. Um, blockchain is, uh, is pretty famous in Germany um, because um, we're doing blockchain technology a lot in engineering. Uh, there's always this, um, uh, I, I will uh, show this in a slide later, uh, this idea, what, what can we do with blockchain? So it's, it's always like this, yeah, we, we know there's a technology and we know it's, it's, it's interesting, there's uh, some, some mystical crypto cryptography in it. Um, but the idea is, um, what shall we do with it? Um, so I'm trying to um, get a, a little bit of definition in, t in technology, I'll show you some, something about use cases, talk a little bit about ICOs, and then uh, show you um, the project that we are doing uh, with digital identity. So uh, the definition of blockchain, uh, a continually s a growing list of records called blocks, which are linked and secured using cryptography. Um, so it's like an order book. Yeah? Uh, we call it a uh, write once, read only database. Um, and it's, it's a pretty rotten database, actually, uh, because um, you simply cannot store a lot of information in this. Um, so the main idea that we, uh, why we need blockchain is um, because blockchain is um, something that we call a new, new, new tool set, a new, uh, it's a new tool in the internet we have. So, um, people always mix up Bitcoin and blockchain. It's really important, there's completely separated things. So it's like apple and oranges or apple and, and peaches. Um, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. It's invented by um, Satoshi Nakamoto. It's, uh, it's, this is not really a name, it's only a uh, it's a, it's a, like a fantasy name. Uh, nobody knows who who this guy is, um, and the underlying technology that Bitcoin is using is called blockchain. And you can you can think of Bitcoin as a as a global experiment that is running since 2009. And Bitcoin has its ups and downs, and it's it's very volatile as a currency. So it's um, it's it's pretty bad. Um, to get your, uh, your loans on it, um, but it's never been broken. Blockchain itself has never been broken. And this is something that's really interesting. I mean, if you look at the, the Bitcoin network itself, it's, it's right now it's over 10,000 nodes. Nodes are actually the computers that are sharing this, this information. And you see that it's mainly in, uh, in uh, Northern America and Europe. Um, and People normally say that um, uh, the miners are all in, in China. Um, this is kind of true, but the main, the main idea behind um, Bitcoin is that you can, you can set up a knot very easily. And the idea who owns or who, who gets money out of this system is something completely different. So it's, it's a system that we, we're using um, a mining process in it. Uh, I'm trying to um, get a bit of an idea it consists, blockchain consists of cryptography, so we need a system that is highly cyber resilient. Uh, we have a P2P network, something that we, maybe you know Napster from, the, from uh, um, some years ago. So the idea behind it is to have an, a distributed uh, system of nodes, it's a P2P network. We have a consensus mechanism. This is something um, that we need in order to say which information gets stored actually in the blockchain. So this is something that we, we need to deal with. Then we have the ledgers. These are the, uh, the main 
um, the main idea be behind a distributed ledger technology. And we have some uh, validity rules uh, that are coming from, <clears throat> from the technology behind it. We have uh, a Bitcoin, we have Ethereum, we have Dash, we have all kinds of different technologies and there's some kind, some kind of val validity rules in it. So, um, to get an idea, we have the distributed network, the ledgers, transaction and blocks. And first of all, I mean, <clears throat> the network itself is pretty easy. Uh, the idea behind it is that it's, it's called cyber resilient. So you do not have a single point of failure here. So the, the system itself is completely distributed. So um, they, the nodes themselves, they synchronize. And uh, we do not need any backup because all the nodes have all the information on it. So if one fails or one goes down, it simply doesn't matter. And um, so um, the, the main idea behind it is that it's simply insensitive for uh, uh, denial of services attack. Um, the other thing that we have, uh, it's a bit, bit up, um, is uh, we're dealing with blocks. So a block is actually something, do you want to see? Uh, absolutely, um, you, you can. It, it, it is centralized in a way that it, it owns Facebook. Yeah? Facebook itself has a lot of data centers and the information that is stored technically are stored in clusters. So, so it, is, it is centralized in the way that they are owned only by Facebook. I mean, Bitcoin, for instance, is about uh, 140 gigabyte at the moment. Um, so you need to download it first, and then you can run it as a full node. Um, so yeah, it is kind of expensive, so to say. Uh, even um, the en energy consumption of Bitcoin is like Ireland. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's really massive. Uh, so this is something that is yeah, it's something to discuss. I mean, it's, it's not that it's... Uh, um, it's it's some, somehow um, yeah, energy compliant or whatever. So it's, it's something, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, people saying that Bitcoin is so secure because it, it has such a high energy load. Um, but the idea behind, um, behind this centralized and decentralized version is that in a distributed way, um, you simply can, can hook up any kind of knot. And this is a, we call it a permissionless ledger. So uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, you can, you can set it up yourself. You just download it and promote your node, and then you're in the, in the network. So there's, it's, it's really something autonomous. So yep. does really every of 10,000 nodes store every single yes. piece of information? We have different, um, different nodes. We have full nodes that actually have the complete information, and we have nodes that only have the, the, um, the, the first information of, of any, any block. So they're they much smaller. Yeah? So, but um, the main idea is that, that every node, uh, so as a full node, is have every information. Of nodes or a piece of information that is stored? Is it like 10% of all nodes? Or? The question was, is it necessary that we, we need a, a special amount of, of nodes to store this information? A minimum? Um, yes, it is. Um, but in this case, it, I mean, with 10,000, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, very, very high. Yeah, yeah? It gets 100 times more users, even 100 times more nodes. They can't store 100 times more information. No, it's not like this. No, it's not that, um, uh, it, it's, not, it's not scaling up like, like linear. This, this is it's not working. So it's something that uh, is even uh, a very big problem. Scalability is a very big problem with Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, right now, we have uh, uh, several forks in, in Bitcoin right now. Um, so it's, it's called, right now, they, 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 they're going to a certain point and then they fork it. So they have different uh, version of Bitcoin right now. Then we have Bitcoin Cash and they're trying to, to I'm sorry? Bitcoin Gold. Yeah, Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Cash. And then we, they, they're trying to, um, uh, they try to um, change the way that they store the information on it, the amount of data that they can store on it. Normally you can store about one megabyte in, in, a, in a block. 
and uh, right now you can you can store more information in it and um, this is something um, that leads to a very very high insecurity um, in in between all these different uh, enthusiasts um, so we have nodes then we have the blocks the blocks are something um, the blockchain is something um, it's it's trailing blocks so the the, the block that is new always has the information of all the information before. So we, we're starting um, with the Genesis block, so it's the first block ever, and you append all these blocks. So um, the idea behind it is like if you're building a tower with, with some, some pieces of wood, um, you build a tower up, you, you cannot get any block out of it, out of this tower, otherwise you would, would destroy the whole um, tower. So this is something that is um, we call um, a distributed point of truth. Yeah? Everybody who is who's with this network um, tell that the new block is some kind of truth and as this information cannot be changed, this is something, is, this is something that's really new. This is really, uh, if, you, if you think about it, um, this is something that is really um, yeah, something that changes a lot of information, a lot of ways that you can store information. So, in the blocks, we have uh, um, the link to the previous block, we have the timestamp, uh, we have the information about the transaction, if it's, uh, if it's uh, um, Bitcoin, for instance, it's a, a transaction of, of, um, of currencies, and um, they're getting added um, by solving a math puzzle. So it is something that is, um, this is something that, that is actually um, so much um, uh, energy consuming uh, because this, this puzzle gets even harder to solve. So this is uh, something as, as blockchain grows, the puzzle always gets, gets harder. So then we have the ledger, it's starting with a Genesis block, and then it, it always relates to the block before. So this is something that's really important. And by doing this, uh, we know that if, you, if you're getting block four out of this, out of this ledger, um, everything else that's, that's coming behind is, uh, is absolutely useless. So this is something um, that is really important. So we call this immutability, and uh, this, all this information is, uh, we call it a linked list of blocks. Uh, so this is the ledger, and the other thing is the transaction. This is mainly, this is mainly the content of it. Uh, we want to do something. I mean, we have uh, we have two bitcoins, and uh, we're getting this in, we're getting this out. We have the transaction, and then we um, we store the information um, that the, the bitcoin actually are changing their owners, so to say. Yeah. So this is um, what we call a deep backend. Yeah. We're using the the name deep backend in our um, team, and this is like something like a a new tool in your toolbox. And um, by, by having this, um, if you're using Bitcoin or Ethereum as a developer, you can simply use it. It, it, it costs nothing. I mean, you can simply use it. You can set up a new um, a D app, for instance, and simply run it. So why blockchain? We reduce the risk for trust between stakeholders, be simply because people cannot betray such a system. As the blocks are in the blockchain, they have a consensus there, so everybody agrees that this information is, is correct. And after that, you, you do not need to discuss with somebody if this information has been changed or something, because it cannot be changed. This is something you, you need to think about. This, uh, this is really important. Uh, we're building a secure uh, value transfer system. Um, you can use it with currencies, but you can even use it with diamonds. Um, there's a, another project called Everledger that they actually uh, trade diamonds on it. So we, the, the, all the information about the ownership, about the, um, the way that this diamond is done, whatever, uh, whatever <laughs> all kind of things are in there, um, is, um, is transferred with a blockchain. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, we streamline businesses. Um, this is something, um, I don't know if there are any programmers here. Um, we have 
an own programming language in it. Uh, you can use different ones. Um, they're called smart contracts. Um, it, yeah, it sounds like it is a contract, but actually it is pure code. So um, the, the name is somehow a bit difficult. Um, in, in other um, blockchains, they're called chain code. I like it much, much more, the idea that it's, it's something that, that is a code that is somehow um, related to the chain. Um, but what you can do there by, by um, uh, programming such a system is you have self-executable code. Um, this is something, if you think about, uh, in, uh, for instance, with uh, Ethereum as a currency as well, it's called the, the currency behind Ethereum is called Ether. Um, you, can, you can program any kind of information that is doing it instantly and uh, you do not need any, kind, any other system with it and you do not even need lawyers for it because everything is in the code. So what you need there, you need a good auditor in order to, <laughs> to track if this information, if this smart contract is correct. So we already had something, maybe um, some of you know that we, uh, the DAO hack. Uh, this was actually a smart contract as well. Uh, so it, it simply, it, it didn't even fail. It's, 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 uh, sometimes you call a thing a bug, sometimes you call it a feature. Actually, it was a feature, uh, but, this, but this led to a, a leakage that actually got uh, $150 million um, out of the system. And that led to a, a hard fork so that we actually have a system uh, that Ethereum, even, even uh, as we say it is immutable, they simply reset it to a, s a certain date before. So this is something um, people that are uh, pure into blockchain systems, um, they somehow say that it was very, very bad to do this, but they simply didn't have any other um, way to, to uh, react uh, because otherwise, I mean, it's, it's really money. I mean, $150 million, it's, ni it's not like um, you, can, you can discuss that, that this uh, is no problem. Um, the other thing is uh, transparency. And you need to think of transparency in, in two different ways. Uh, as we're using a lot of cryptography here, uh, the system as, um, as the, the transaction themselves are transparent, but the information inside can always be hidden by cryptography. And people always tend to do not understand that this is not an, an, an anonymous system here. So um, we're dealing with a um, PKI system. So we have a, a private key and we have a public key that is actually, you, you're signing information with your private key and you have a, the hash of the public key is actually the address that somebody can send you any kind of information like a value or, what, or Bitcoin or whatever. Um, but this, this public key that you're using um, is the thing that, um, that people can, can relate to in order to track who did a certain information, who did a certain transaction. So it's not anonymous. Uh, there are certain blockchains that are really anonymous, like Zcash, but Bitcoin or Ethereum, for instance, they are not anonymous. Really important um, um, because uh, otherwise the discussion is some, somehow misled some, sometimes. So use cases. Um, if you think uh, what you can do with blockchain, um, you start with whatever mobility or real estate or whatever, and you. you you're not stopping. Yeah? There's so many use cases. I mean, as Bitcoin was starting with, um, with a currency, it's clear that financial services were one of the first use cases that uh, actually arise um, with blockchain. But even in, in Germany, we have a lot of discussions right now, even with the blockchain association, in order to give um, the government certain information to start certain uh, government systems with blockchain in the next in the next round. We uh, we just had an election, uh, so they um, they figure out the new uh, government right now, and um, uh, we will start with blockchain systems for governments, and very close. I mean, Estonia is one of the um, of the yeah 
they, they have so many uh, information done with the e-government systems right now and they, they, they're getting it all into blockchain systems. And even um, cities like, like uh, Dubai, yeah? they call it Smart Dubai, they call it the, um, the happiest city on earth. Um, all their information that they store for, their, uh, for their, all their uh, doings is all stored in blockchain systems. And, I mean, you can discuss if this is really distributed. We just had this, in, uh, this question here. Um, it, this has mainly the, um, the idea of cyber resilience and security. So there, there's uh, different um, things that you can do with blockchain, so it's, it's getting a bit complicated. You have permissionless blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum. And then you have permissioned blockchain, so this is something that a, a state would normally um, a drive, like, like Smart, uh, Smart Dubai, for instance, they're, they're using a, a permission blockchain, so they, all this thing is, they have a governance system on it, and they are running the nodes, so they, they, you cannot introduce a node on your own for a system like Smart Dubai, it's not possible. Um, so this is something, it's, it's getting a bit complicated because it is simply an underlying technology and with the technology, you can, you can uh, simply go into new use cases and then arise something like, yeah, what we do, digital identity here. Um, health system is uh, one of the, the th uh, things that we will see in the near future. Um, we have a lot of uh, supply chain um, use cases in Germany right now. Um, very big ones and uh, supply chain finance as well. Uh, I don't know if, you, if, if it's, it's, it says, it tells you something what supply chain finance is. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's something that you, you, need to, you need to finance certain information and then you have a, a, always a latency in between paying and getting back money. So if, if you're doing supply chain finance, you're simply getting the man in the middle out of the system and get it onto a, a, a ledger system here and then have certain rights and roles in it and then you can, you can streamline such a system and get the trust um, through all these different parties into such a system. Yeah? So if you, if you uh, want to know that somebody is, um, you, you sell a, a, certain, um, a certain good to somebody else and you want to know if, if the money that you, you're doing with it uh, is getting back to you as you sold it, this is something you can do, you, that you can do with blockchain technology very easily. And, um, yes, please. Sup supply chain finance. Mostly there are permissioned ones. Um, we have in, in Germany, we have Fraunhofer Institute. Um, they're somehow they're getting the money a lot of from, from the state. And they're using Hyperledger a lot. So it's a technology that is a consortium uh, built by Hitachi, IBM, and uh, the, the Linux Foundation. Uh, so this is a permission system. Um, and yeah, but we will see other um, forms of supply chain finance with permissionless blockchains in the future as well. Um, so use cases, to make it short, financial instruments, records and models, um, public records, private records. So these are the, the main in, uh, differences here. Um, Semi-public records, physical asset keys, uh, intangibles like coupons, vouchers, ticket systems, and all kind of other things. I mean, there's, there's so many uh, that you can, uh, you can list. Um, this, um, you, you cannot stop. I mean, it's, it's something that you, you really should uh, make up your mind and, and uh, look at it, um, because um, if you have a, a, a working system um, or you have, you have a startup and, and you, you simply need some kind of trust in the system, you should think about introducing blockchain as a deep backend here as well, because I mean, it, it, it saves you a lot of money if you're, if you're using uh, permissionless systems, and um, you can introduce trust. Uh, so that's something that's really, really important. Um, a few words about ICO, initial coin offering. Um, I mean, this is something, uh, it's a mixture of a crowdfunding or crowd invest, and an IPO that we see um, with normal corporates. Um, the thing why we can do this with blockchain uh, has uh, certain um, uh, backgrounds. 
Uh, in blockchain, uh, we can use a system like Bitcoin or Ethereum in order to use it um, to get money from people. And then we can, we can gather this money and get a side chain to actually um, initiate a new coin. Uh, so this is something, um, uh, for instance, in, in our case, so we're dealing with digital identity, so we can introduce something uh, like a, a name coin. Um, and you can, um, you can invest in us by buying a certain amount of coins and these, these coins are actually um, uh, related to Bitcoin. So we get the money from the Bitcoin side or from the Ethereum side. And there's a certain token that we, it's called IRC20 token that actually has the, uh, the information about um, the, um, the value of our coin dependent to Bitcoin or Ether. Yeah? So we have a sale that we say, okay, we, we raise up um, 20 billion coins and each coin has a certain, um, a certain value. So you can buy them and then we can trade these coins. Yeah? And this coin is something as we're dealing, um, as I said, with um, uh, self-executable smart contracts and with a business, um, business model behind it. Uh, you, for, in, for us, for instance, we trade the information about um, digital identity. So we have a, um, organizations need trusted identities. So they're willing to buy this information about a, trade, uh, about a trusted identity. And by doing so, we can, we can sell always this, this information and incentivize people that uh, did the ICO, that did this, um, this, um, this sale before, and they, they simply earn money by it. And, I mean, um, everybody was thinking about um, what would be the first big use case for blockchain. And nobody thought about that ICO is actually the first big use case. I mean, it's really a massive use case. If you're looking at, at the numbers here, I mean, we had um, Bancor, uh, 156 millions. They had, they had nearly next to nothing. They had a, a certain amount of code and they had a, some kind of vision to say, okay, they want to do some banking on the blockchain. Uh, they did a white paper. It's, not, it's always the same. Um, you have an, an, a vision, you're doing a white paper, you build up a team, set up a website, um, you're getting this and that. And it's, it's pretty uh, complicated um, to, to f um, start a foundation because it's yeah, please. Have you did any ICO? I'm sorry? Have you, did, have you ever launched any ICO? No, I'm, I'm, I never uh, launched an ICO. Are you profitable? I'm sorry? Are you profitable? Are capable, yes. Yes, pretty easily, yes. Maybe we can work. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. But you need to have a good idea. I mean, right now I'm, I'm getting... Really, every single day I get a proposal by somebody who wants to do an ICO and want me to, to do some kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Talk later. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really hard because um, the trust in such a system uh, fades away as a lot of scam actually um, comes up. So people really, uh, I mean, they're betraying. Yeah, please. Yes. So fundamentally, any currency, even in the most widest definition of the word currency, has to be, has to be backed by something of value. Yeah? Yeah. Never going to change in a million years. <coughs> Anything which is it's either virtual or paper backed, it doesn't matter. It has to be backed. It doesn't have to be backed by one person. It can be backed by 10,000 people, and this way it's actually more transparent. Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin. Um, you, you can you can simply buy Bitcoin yeah. by an exchange. Yeah, you you you're exchanging your what we call fiat money or your, your 
euros or whatever dollars, you can exchange them to Bitcoin. Um, the idea, the idea. Yes. Uh, you can go to a bank and give them this dollar and they'll give you gold. Yes. Yeah? And that's not exactly true. It, it was once, that's yeah. <laughs> that's a fundamental yes. backing idea of it, yeah? Right. And since they changed that rule, it's less shaky, it's more shaky, I understand that. But fundamentally, all throughout the history, whatever the currency it was, it was paper or there were sticks at some point in England, a long time ago, for example. The stick had no value. But it was because it was given by a bank, by authority, Go back and say, give me my gold back. Yes. So I understand it's convertible nowadays, but what is it that fundamentally makes it of value? Yeah. Yeah, you have to you have to un you have to think about it a bit more um, in deep. Um, first of all, um, that the guy is anonymous is uh, Sat uh, Satoshi Nakamoto um, has a reason because. Uh, it, he, he al already f uh, knew that there were a lot of bad things happening and a lot of discussion happening around it. Um, so the idea behind uh, Bitcoin back in the days were really a public experiment. Yeah? And what we see right now, um, it is simply not backed by gold. And we see the volatility is, is enormous. Right now we have uh, one Bitcoin is about $6,000. Um, two years ago, it was four hundred fifty dollars, yeah? and we even have uh, kind of spikes sometimes, where even the ether some, sometimes fall to fifty dollar, yeah? and then go back again. So it, that, this is nothing um, that a, a, a national bank could could drive. Yeah? Um, so this is really an experiment, and um, you you have to think of um, this ICOs. The, the, the idea, what is the value behind the, the currency itself, is something that you really need to discuss. And this is why there are so many scams are actually there. Um, and um, the, the in, in Germany, for instance, Bitcoin is not considered as a currency. Yeah? So it's only considered as an asset. And the uh, Bundesbank in Germany, they, they're saying this just because what, what you, you told. Yeah? It's not backed by anything that is related to gold or whatever. Yeah? I mean, I so. understand that it doesn't have to be backed by national uh, government agencies. It doesn't have to be backed by a group of people. It's fine if it's backed, it's backed by thousands of people. Yeah? I, 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 I tell you again. Yeah. Yeah. It will be dollars. It will collapse. Yeah. The question was um, if uh, if Bitcoin or Ether, I, I guess Ether as well. Um, if if I think that uh, this is really a currency, or if this m may collapse because it, it simply it it maybe it, it's reaching a, a, a peak and then getting uh, yeah uh, invalid or whatever. Um, yeah. I mean, um, you really need to think. Um, if you if you're thinking um, about about Bitcoin and what what happened uh, in the in the near f uh, in the near past um, was really something that you could not trust Bitcoin in the way that you could uh, do this as really a currency because I mean these, these forks for instance we have a, a fork right now with Bitcoin Gold for instance right now running so they will uh, launch in in two days. And two days, yeah, yeah, and um, they ha they have no clue how to get along with a very fundamental um, uh, technology um, to get trust in a system in order to prevent double spending and to prevent uh, the way that um, this this forks actually need to um, um, be to have uh, some kinds of governance. Yeah? So, yes, for. For right now, it's it's simply something that you you can play with it. If you're using your your play money with it, you're fine. Um, these ICOs, um, there are a lot of money laundering there as well in it. Um, China uh, has already forbidden ICOs. Um, in America, the um, ICOs is right now considered as securities a lot. 
So you need to um, define what the ICO actually is for, and a lot of them is under, under the law for securities. And um, in Germany, for instance, uh, we do not have um, a, a jurisdiction for it right now. So law is simply uh, not fast enough for such a technology. And uh, you, you see here, Ethereum is there as well. So Ethereum as a currency started as an ICO as well. They, they, they were an ICO with Bitcoin. Yeah. So um, you really need to consider this as, as uh, the early days for, for currencies. And uh, so um, I agree that I wouldn't, I wouldn't get my money in it, um, but the use cases themselves, um, for instance, what we do with digital identity has nothing to do with, with currency and, and burn money or something. So it has simply to do with trust and, and use cases. I agree with you. I mean, this, but this is something you, you can you can discuss very very long. Yeah. And um, what is a currency? I mean, you, you, um, the double spending problem itself is solved. So this is, was the main uh, the main reason why we didn't had any kind of uh, cyber cash was the double spending problem. Double spending problem to um, to explain this. Um, if you have an, uh, like a file that represents some kind of money, and you copy this file. Yeah. You, you, you have a double spending, so you need to uh, be, be sure that this information itself is always unique. And this is simply um, uh, completely solved with blockchain technology, so double spending is really no problem. And then you can discuss if um, a euro, for instance, if you have cash, yeah, um, you, you can use cash, or you can you can use you can use it as a as a as a, um, a blockchain system. It it wouldn't matter. It's only physics. Yeah? This one is physics, and, and this one is is simply a, a digital um, a representation of it. So this would would fit perfectly. But I mean, um, they're simply not not fast enough for this. Uh, so the history of ICOs. I mean, right now it's it's getting. Um, Really bizarre sometimes uh, what happens with ICOs. Uh, I hope you, you're lucky with it. I don't know what your project is, <laughs> but um, it's, really, it's really bizarre. You have a question. Yeah, I think Tezos is some, somehow interesting. You know, Tezos is really, really a, Tezos. You know, a big success here at the scene. Uh, $30 billion. So even if, if it is mentioned in the 16Z podcast, so it's very popular. So, but right now, I did something this morning that. Yeah, the question was, I mean, Tezos, uh, we have Tezos, they, they, they really um, made a very big ICO, very successful and um, a very good team anyway. And um, uh, right now they're under investigations and, um, and the reason behind it is uh, that the team split up. Uh, so we have uh, the main founder, um, I don't know what, what actually what he made his mind of, uh, because he simply wanted to get all the money out of this uh, out of this system, and simply wanted to to uh, get away. Normally, what you do with an ICO, um, you're building up a fund in order to um, uh, to secure the money from from all these different stakeholders, um, so that everything works as expected. And um, if you want to get away with the money, <laughs> yeah then um, uh, investigations arise. And this is something that, that happens right now. Tezos, um, the, the, the team split up. Um, the founder actually one has a completely different idea what, what Tezos should uh, um, do with it. Uh, and this is um, something that is, um, uh, what he's, he's actually for is, is pretty bad. I mean, uh, so um, I don't know what, what, uh, what will happen with it, but I think um, it will work out because the team itself is very, very good. Yeah, so I think um, hmm? yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's uh, 232 million dollars, and the um, um, thing is that with, with this volatility, uh, some of these the, um, gnosis are some friends of mine. Um, they only had um, 13 millions, but as the ether rises, um, very very strong, it even gets much much more um, uh, money. So, um, and then I want to tell you what we're doing. Um, maybe um, uh, if you have any question, please please ask me. I'm here for, for answering your questions. Um, 
we call it the four steps. So we have this um, recording of information. It's like an order book. Yeah? It's only an order book. It's a perfect order book, but um, it's only an order book. Then we have the transactions, so it's really exchanging of assets. On top of that, we have the, the smart contracts, so we have really a, a, a programmable platform. And on top of that, we have the, uh, something we call the DAO, uh, um, an autonomous organization, so to say. And, and, and what we're doing with Helix uh, is something else um, that is uh, on top of all these systems, because what we do is uh, we're dealing with interoperability in between different systems. And uh, we're doing something that's like a, a blockchain, uh, a digital identity platform. But all these information, normally they, they always have uh, some kind of wallet um, that you need to, um, to build on your own in order to have the uh, private public key system. And then you have some kind, if, you, if you're doing it um, in a way that is more secure, they're using offline wallet systems. I hope you're using this. <laughs> Uh, or you can, you can use uh, systems that store this information for you. So um, um, you can think of what, what can happen if you, if, if you have somebody else storing your keys. Um, this, it, it can be really bad. And um, this happened, um, I think, already twice. Um, so um, somebody broke in their systems and uh, used these... Um, keys in order to yeah, make nonsense with it, and uh, people simply lose their uh, Bitcoin and Ethers with it. Um, so, but we have here, what we have here, we always need a digital identity because um, behind all these information, there's always a person. There's always a person. It can be a company as well, but it's always a person. You always need trusted accounts. Yeah? And if you do not have trusted accounts, it will not get into adoption for mass market. Yeah? Because otherwise, I mean, um, it's simply something more for the, for the cyber nerds in order to yeah, run their own wallets and, and uh, know that if they, if they fail and if, this, um, if, the, if the wallet, um, uh, if they lose it, they will lose all their information, they will lose all their money. Yeah? It, there's no way, there's no governance in, in Ether and, and Bitcoin so that they, you, could, you could go to and tell them, okay, I, I lost my private key, I need it back. Yeah, you lost. <laughs> it's something you need to know. And um, this is something, if we're de do dealing with um, um, really um, serious systems, uh, if you're dealing with companies, if you're dealing with digital identities, um, we cannot do this. I mean, uh, you cannot um, build up a digital identity and then um, uh, after two years, um, somebody loses it and, and if all this information is gone. It's, it's not possible. So we need governance here. So, we have seen all these different use cases here. Um, uh, I showed you in industry, supply chain, um, um, airlines, a lot of uh, airlines are actually um, experimenting with blockchain. Uh, financial services, clear, entertainment, there's a lot of in-app um, gaming uh, blockchains right now that are um, uh, being built. And uh, we have digital identities. Um, right now, they're calling it the holy grail of, of, um, of blockchain technology because this is something is like, I mean, we have the first use case as, um, as um, oh, this is another one, I, I get back to this one. Um, no, let me, let, me, let me get with this one. Um, um, we, have, we have all this information um, done already. Um, but what we need right now is um, we need an, an digital identity. And uh, KYC is something, and maybe you know this one, is know your customer process. Uh, this is the way that you're dealing when you're on board on, on to a bank, for instance, or for, to an insurer. Um, the insurer or the bank normally uh, need to check the information about you as a customer. Um, and this information is called, this process is called know your customer, know your client. And this is something this is really expensive. The other thing is e-government. Uh, there are a lot of different um, um, governments and, and countries um, experimenting with e-government systems right now. We have identity access management systems, so it's uh, coming from, from the corporate side, going through systems that are cross-industry, cross-organization. So um, starting from the idea that Microsoft once had, um, with, uh, they called it Passport once, 
um, that you have a single information where you get all the information about uh, your, your, um, your stuff and, and all your, your people, where they, can into, uh, where they can enter into rooms, into, into digital systems and whatever. Uh, they failed pretty bad, Microsoft. Um, but right now it's, it's a new start and uh, Microsoft is even uh, restarting this in, um, uh, project as well. And we consider um, digital identity as a platform because we think that if you have the information about a trusted identity underneath, you can build up any kind of use case on top. And this is why we call this a platform. And why is this important? I already uh, said that um, uh, out there, <laughs> you should consider that it's always worse than you think. Um, there's some other, I mean, Bitfenex um, um, is not on here. Um, they really, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they secured their database with an admin, admin uh, account. I mean, 150, 140 million accounts a lot of information in it from, uh, from uh, personal users. And um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you cannot consider that uh, data stored in any kind of legacy system is secure. You simply, you cannot, um, you cannot rely on this. Yeah? And this is um, through all systems. Yeah? If, you, if you ever worked in a, in a data center, if you ever worked in a, in a big uh, corporate, People are always checking in, checking out, stuff is changing, um, and this is always a race that companies simply cannot win against hackers or crackers or whatever you want to call them. Um, so this is why, I mean, lessons learned. You simply need a system um, that is secure from the ground up, where you have cryptocurrency, uh, crypt, um, cryptography simply built in. It's really important. Otherwise, it's, it's, not, import it's, it's not possible to, to secure systems anymore. It's absolutely impossible. And the idea, if, it is, if this, this information is accessed publicly on a, on a server or not, simply doesn't matter. You should not consider your, your system in your company as closed or, or secured. You should not consider this. <laughs> it's, it's simply not true. Um, so what we have here in the introduction in the, um, blockchain technology, what we see that um, um, digital identity is um, need to be the first uh, thing that uh, need to be uh, done um, in order to get all this cycle um, done. Um, and we consider a digital identity um, with 10 commandments. Uh, they're coming from um, United Nations. Um, they have a program running called ID2020 um, that has a lot to do um, with um, unbanked people, with um, humanity. And then we have regulatory commandments. In Germany, we have the GDPR um, that has certain, um, certain rules for companies that are really strict. Um, and then we have uh, your restrictions. And all these things together simply lead to these uh, 10 commandments we have. Um, so, um, United Nations, for instance, say that a, a digital identity need to be um, existent. Um, you can say, yeah, of course it is, it is existent, but uh, it's not true, because uh, what we see right now, um, we have so many IoT devices. Yeah? And an IoT device, you, you, you need to consider, is an IoT, an IoT device that it is an identity or not? Uh, right now, it is not. In the future, it will be. Yeah, so right now, we're talking about right now, um, it is not an identity. Um, the right to access information, you need to think of um, all the information that is stored about you in any kind of database from any kind of, of corporate that you're doing business with. Um, you, can, you can ask your insurance company what they, uh, what they have about you in their databases. They will not, they will not give you access to it. Yeah. But they, they need to do so. GDPR, the, the, it's, it's coming in um, early next year in, in Germany. Um, GDPR tells the companies that they, will, that they need to give customers access to this data in order to see what is in there and that they, need to, uh, that they can change this. And um, 
uh, this is something that um, uh, nearly uh, no, com no company right now has this. Um, so it's pretty bad because um, the fines, if they, if they fail, are very, very high. Yeah? So this right to access, the other thing is it needs to be persistent. I mean, this is, this is clear. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about your digital identity and you, you think about yourself and you say, okay, I want to um, at least want to be uh, 80 years old or something, and um, then you, you, you need to say that this is a long-term storage process here. And as I already said, blockchain technology coming from a Genesis block is growing up far, ever and ever and ever. This is really a long-term storage system. And consider which other system is on the market. I mean, you, you, you could use Oracle, for instance. But Oracle, every five to six years, changing their systems completely. Yeah? So uh, normally, uh, such a system needs to be um, persistent for 60 years. Yeah? At least 60 years. Yeah? And, and it needs to be accessible ever then. This is something that normally nobody thinks about this. But if you're thinking about the internet, I mean, it's, it's, it's simply only a couple of years old. The iPhone was, was not there 10 years ago. Um, so um, the way that we need to think about this simply leads to blockchain technology. There's no other way to do so. Then we have the transparency system, uh, transparency in, in transaction. We need to be interoperable. Um, this is um, because we simply, I mean, if you have a, a, a digital identity that, re uh, that represents you as a digital yeah, person, uh, you, you want to do something with it, <laughs> otherwise it's simply useless. So you need to have interoperability with any kind of other systems. And this is why we call a blockchain a deep backend, because the interoperability here, it can be very, very deep in between different blockchains. But this is normally, this is, uh, this is something we will achieve this in about two years or so. We will achieve this. But we can achieve this already because we have a stack that's coming from the blockchain as a deep backend. Then we have the smart contracts that simply has some kind of programming language on top of it. And then we still have Java on top of it and that we can do any kind of, of uh, interoperability with. Um, as we're doing this server side, uh, we're introducing uh, security there as well. The other thing is about portability. Think of, of any kind of system where you have your digital identity and, and you stick with it. <laughs> yeah? And you want, to, you want to have another vendor to introduce the market. So you need to be portable. And then you need to think of um, what, what kind of information do you, do you gather with your digital identity and do you want this information to, to flow in between all these different uh, vendors? So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty tough. Um, this is why um, we will see a digital identity token or the identity token like the IRC20 that we have uh, for currencies. Uh, we will see um, identity tokens in the near future. Um, it's already um, begun for, for Ethereum systems. Um, that simply says, um, I, can, I can consider a digital identity system and later on I can change the system to any other vendor. So no, this is um, something that's really important and uh, something is coming from the law as well. Um, a concept is pretty, pretty easy. Then we have the, the principle of minimalization. is something that um, normally you do not think about this, but um, what we have right now, um, if, if we're dealing with information, personal information, you want to buy whatever, maybe an, um, maybe an iPhone. You, you want to buy an iPhone and, and for, this, for this purpose, you give information to your digital, for your, from your digital identity to this vendor. And normally what, you, what we have here right now is um, the vendor gets all kind of information from you. And it's not necessary. Yeah? Think of, um, I'm sorry. Uh, think of um, buying uh, cigarettes. In Germany, for instance, uh, you can only buy cigarettes when you're over 18. Uh, so we have, um, we have these uh, cigarette machines um, in, the, in the streets, and they have a, um, a slot for it, and you, you get your, your passport through, and um, it, it, it reads everything from your passport. 
but everything you need in terms of minimalization is only a flag, I'm over 18. That's it. Yeah? And this is why we built the system as well, that we always uh, following the rules of minimalization, that we say, okay, ev only the information that is necessary simply gets exchanged in between these trading parties. And you always see this. This is something that is even um, more important. You, we always need to be compliant. Compliant is, um, I don't know if, if you know what, what compliance means. Uh, you, need, you need to stick to rules. And, and compliance uh, rules are always something, if you're coming from the corporate side, uh, I guess you know what this means. <laughs> it's a, really a pain. Yeah? Um, protection is clear. And uh, the other thing that we have here is, uh, it, it sounds a bit weird. Um, but we need to follow the right to be forgotten. I mean, uh, uh, certain people simply want to delete certain information about them. It's, and this is uh, called the right to be forgotten. So you can say that, okay, uh, he's telling about uh, immutability and, and these things stay in the, in the blockchain forever, and then he, he's telling about the right to be forgotten. It's, it's nonsense. Yeah. Um, but but it can be done because, um, as I said, um, the blockchain is really a very bad database. And um, all this information that we have here from, uh, from these um, individuals, uh, we do not store this, in real, this information, we do not store it in the blockchain. This is the way that digital assets do it, for instance, as well. Um, we only store the truth or the hash or the, the, the trust. This is what we store on the blockchain. So we know that this information is true. We store it, actually, we have a very complicated technical stack. Um, we store this, 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 uh, this real information, we store it in a distributed database that is uh, with uh, certain rules, um, is coupled to the blockchain system itself. Um, so there we can uh, simply delete information in the database, and then the pointer that we store in the, actually in the blockchain uh, simply points to zero simply points to nothing. So with this, from the outside world to say, um, this is something where we can really say that this is forgotten. There's no way to access this data any anymore. Yeah. And overall, it's the information about um, trust. Yeah. So uh, what we have here to make it uh, easy, KYC and identify yourself. Um, we have the corporate side, we have the personal side. Uh, so we call it a win-win situation. Uh, it's a distributed network uh, with a prime identity, and we have privacy by design because only you see information about yourself, and we have security by design because we, we're using cryptography in such a system, and such a system is really not hackable. Even if you're doing a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of um, information technology and a lot of server, you, you could maybe explore or uh, hack one single block Maybe. Yeah, we, we're talking about a 2048-bit cryptography. It's really, really hard to, uh, to attack such a system. But this would simply only attack one block. So in, in, an, in a Bitcoin system, we have somehow in between seven minutes from one block to the other. So you have seven minutes to attack it. Otherwise, there's already a new block that you need to attack then. So you can, you can think of it, how, how secure such a system is. We, we have a very, very high loads of blocks. It's getting very, very uh, fast. Um, so it's, it's, it's from, uh, from uh, now on, um, I, mean, I, co I couldn't think of a, of a system to, to hack this information. And um, important is that we see the, the person itself in the middle. So it's something we call a self-sovereign identity. And then we have certain services. We have identity services. We have data as a service. It's a high secure data um, um, server as well. And we have payment services. Payment services getting a bit, a bit later as we simply need real currency in such a system. And then underneath it, been on, we, have, uh, we call it a trust provider network consisting of any kind of uh, cross-industry partners. And then we have all these different um, trust takers, we call them. Yeah? So if somebody from the insurance side needs the information about a trusted identity, um, they, can, they can use it. So uh, know your customer 
right now is, is yeah, it's, it's really a mess. And um, what we have there, this is needed. Uh, we have the client onboarding process. We have the monitoring uh, with the, the audit trail. And then we have the um, reporting for the regulatories. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough business. <laughs> and um, the market is, is very, very big. I mean, the saving, this is uh, from 2014. Savings even higher. Um, they, they told it's about 25%. Uh, and if you're looking for at it, so it's a, a $18 billion market in, in 2014, and it's growing very, very fast. So it's really a huge market. If there's somebody from the Turkey side who wants to get into this market, <laughs> I can highly recommend it. Um, and I think it was okay. And um, what we only need um, three steps to, to uh, get a digital identity because. What we have in Germany, I, I don't know if in Turkey you have something like this, we have an ID card, and this ID card, we have a, a certain app. You can, um, it's not, not yet ready, it's uh, about uh, two or three weeks. Um, all you need to do is uh, download the app, um, get your ID card behind your, your smartphone, and um, get an uh, activated, and then uh, you have a trusted identity with this system. Because the information here, is stored from a, from a legal site, from a legal source, um, we have directly a, a trusted identity. And um, so uh, after this, um, you can add any kind of information more that you, that you need from, for, for your personal life. But um, if you need to uh, use it for mobility systems or any kind of community stuff or whatever, you, you can simply use it. I mean, it's, it's from a... Yeah, it's, it, Done from the state. Yeah. I'm sorry? In Germany, we call it Bundesdruckerei. Yeah, they're running uh, a cryptography system in it. So um, the, the EID here, we, what, what we have here, uh, you have a PIN code for it. And you, um, you activate your PIN code and get it to the, to the smartphone. So we're right now in, in, uh, in uh, talks with government. We'll see how fast they are. You had a question? No, we do not need a picture because um, this is uh, an NFC technology inside our ID card, and we're using an NFC reader from the uh, from the smartphone. It's you only you only hold it hold it behind your your uh, um, mobile phone. Yes. No. No, Bundesdruckerei um, is actually giving us the data because um, the information uh, that is stored in the EID is, is um, very secure. So um, uh, we're getting the, the information from the Bundesdruckerei as the owner of the EID activated for us, for our, for our system, and then um, activate an account. So it's simply three steps. It's only f uh, two minutes, and then you have a digital identity. And because uh, the system is brand new, uh, with this EID card, uh, we're using it with a, a normal onboarding process as well. If you just go uh, with a form, uh, have a validation, uh, legitimation, and then you have a Helix ID. And then um, with the Helix ID, we call it a uh, Helix Trust. Uh, we need to brand everything, you know. <laughs> Branding is always important. Um, so um, to make it clear, we have the, the customer. Uh, he's doing um, um, all his uh, information in our systems. And then uh, he, he goes to uh, uh, what we call a trust provider once, only once, and uh, get this information trusted and uh, gets a legitimated trusted identity on our systems. And if he goes to, to any other party later, then they, they are actually uh, using it as a trust taker. So this information is already trusted and um, you, you can use it directly without any kind of uh, interference, any, this, everything is, is trusted. So you can use it in a um, completely digital way, you do not need to go there. Um, and um, e-government is something that will, will come back later. Uh, e-government is always, is always, uh, yeah, is always late. Yeah. So these are the, the three main facts, it's sharing workforce, you know, if somebody already um, proved that this information from, from your identity is correct, uh, it can be shared through, uh, through the whole industry. If one bank is 
um, doing this KYC process, this onboarding process completely with all this process, they can use it for any other um, uh, uh, insurer or bank as well. And we have the, um, a huge cost saver with standardization. Um, we have the ISO uh, 307 uh, with blockchain technology already. Um, so standardization is one of the main cost savers we have here. And then the other thing is about data quality, um, because you, you, um, you use it as a self-servant identity. So if something changes, this change will be propagated to this other side that actually has this contract with you. So the data quality for the, for the company side always stays high. Uh, and this, uh, some slides for it, you, know, you have uh, this, um, an information, you have an audit trail here. Um, you can upload any kind of certificate, any kind of, kind of information. Uh, it's not, not yet trusted, you're using the QR code, go to the other side, get it scanned in. So this is, um, um, you can use it with video ident as well. This is the, the manual process. And then um, we're using, a, um, we always need to be compliant. So the user always need to um, give his okay to the other side. And um, he sees everything. He sees that the coin bank in this case uh, wants to have a certain information from him and he complies with a, um, with a um, touch ID and then um, the other side um, has access to his data, can upload any kind of information over the counter for instance and then uh, proceed to validation, uh, um, finalize the onboarding process and then uh, we see that this identity is uh, validated by a certain um, trust provider and uh, after that you can use it for anything. So this is why we call it a pri prime identity and by using blockchain technology and interoperability you can then think of a lot of different use cases because we can, we can integrate and we can include sub-identities then. So we can say that your smart home is considered as a blockchain system as well. You can have a lot of different wallets, keys, whatever and it can be coupled to the main identity. So you can control your whole digital life in such a system. You can control your e-health system, you can control your smart car, you can control your, your banking. Um, everything is from the ground up, is, um, is hidden, so it's, it's closed. It's, it's, it's not anonymous, but it's, um, it's the, the highest, um, highest protection. And from, from, the button, uh, from the top to the bottom, you can control everything. You control your complete digital life there. So this is something um, uh, where, why we, s we call this an identity platform. This is the difference um, that we say it's not a closed system. So we want to um, give this information and the platform to uh, a lot of different um, startups as well to use our technology, to use our frameworks, to use our um, libraries, and then build up use cases for it. Yeah? And that use cases are pretty easy. Yeah, you can, if you want to um, get a smart home in, in it, you can, you, you can look at all these different um, uh, systems right now. There are already uh, power plugs that are um, um, being used um, using blockchain technology, for instance, in Germany, they're already, already used. Um, there are some... Um, some locks for, for bicycles that have already been, been done with blockchain as well in the streets. So you can, you can uh, think of any kind of use case there. So it's the interoperability, interoperability it's a digital identity, physical to virtual. We have a, a prime identity and then we have a private avatar, social media avatar, business avatar, you can think of everything. So you, can, you can extend it to, to whatever state you want. And as it is completely secure, and it is secure from the technology itself, um, you can trust such a system much more than any system that you can think of, because the security is built in such a system. And um, to give you an idea about scalability, um, um, people who know uh, about uh, blockchain technology normally know that it's uh, a proof of work is what we have here normally. So proof of work is something um, where um, the, the high energy consumption comes from and um, where we have um, problems with scalability simply. So um, there are a lot of different um, projects right now coming from Chrome slicing or uh, proof of stake, dedicated proof of stake. There are a lot of different um, scalability and uh, 
um, and consensus um, mechanisms here. Uh, we're using um, named nodes here. We're, this system is right now, it's not a, uh, it is a permission system as well, so the nodes themselves are named. Um, so what we can use here, um, we, we once called it a proof of existence. Um, Pillar um, from, from Gavin uh, called it proof of authority as well. Um, so it's nearly the same, so you can scale up as hell. <laughs> yeah? Because um, you, uh, there's this, this not necessary that you need to uh, have any kind of, of, uh, of puzzle that you need to solve, because we simply ha only need uh, the information that an, an authority stated that this information is true. So um, this is something uh, that we think that um, such a system can be introduced very, very fast and uh, can be um, very powerful. Um, yeah, this is used USP, I mean, it's completely compliant. GDPR, I don't know if, if, if you have something like this in, in Turkey as well, the data protection rights, um, I guess, um, I don't know, it's, it's something, GDPR is coming from the European Union, and European Union is something, uh, uh, everything is a bit, um, um, a lot of um, bureaucracy in it. Um, so, and we have shared workforce, data quality is always high, uh, self-determination is something that's really important uh, nowadays, much more than, than before. Uh, we have a trust provider network and it's, it's private and it is secure. So, um, I think um, if there's any question, I would um, try to, to open this because uh, the other things are not so important, I think. Um, maybe, you, maybe the roadmap is interesting for you. Uh, if, if there's anything you want to know, you can, you can simply uh, address me. So, are there any questions? Anything that I should answer you? Uh, Yes. Oh. Yes. So, uh, we like to make insurance for our from X company, and they ask us that uh, do they recognize Helix already, or you got to make the agreements with them yet? You are in the future. We're right now. Um, we. We right now uh, have um, two different projects running. One is the, the public helix, um, it's more as a civil right thing. Um, this is something that um, will be public uh, in the next two weeks. And um, uh, we have a B2B case, uh, um, big companies to, to big banks. Um, so we need to focus on this right now. So I think we could not, I mean, simply, yeah, how should we do this? <laughs> But um, it's, it's, it, the implementation is, is, is could be done pretty easily. It's, uh, it's something like uh, three to four months uh, to implement such a system. So it might be global kind of global ID card for everybody. Yes, the idea behind it is to have a global ID card or simply do not need an ID card. We need, we, we're using everything yes. with QR codes. Yeah. Yeah. This is why we call it Helix ID and uh, to get this it trusted, it's called Helix Trust. Yeah. Whenever, however, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> you had a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now my question also yes. Ethereum. Ethereum, yeah. We have seen a growth in the cryptocurrency market in the last month, let's say. Yes. Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, last week we had an update on the Ethereum, and we've seen it increasing drastically, uh, reaching $350 per Ethereum. Yes. There, there are so many things that are, um, that are un, um, um, being worked on in, in the Ethereum as well. So we have a, the proof of stake that is something that is um, uh, under heavy uh, development right now and uh, discussion. Um, the scalability thing is, is something that's really crucial. Um, and um, I mean, Ethereum itself um, is, con is thinking of um, expanding their toolbox, their smart contract um, possibilities uh, to ICO capabilities right now. Uh, if they do so, I, w I, I, find it, I would find it very bad if they do so, to be honest. Um, but it's, I mean, it's a huge market. Yeah? So, but there's, there's so many things going on in the Ethereum world. Um, the app is, is something that's, 
Um, right now they're thinking about auditing it because it's, a, it's a, a really a, a security problem otherwise. Um, so it will, it, will, um, it will go very high either. If I am relying on, uh, relying on, on Ethereum, you. me, yes. on Ether, on Ethereum, I'm, I'm, uh, we're using, we're using, actually, we're using uh, Ethereum as a technology underneath a lot. Yeah, we're we're changing a lot of things in it, but Ethereum um, is is um, from the from the idea behind it, like they they call it world computer. Is the idea behind it. Um, the idea is, is very, very good, and um, um, I mean, Vitalik Buterin is, is really one of the brilliant minds in the world. Uh, he's really, um, he's, he's really uh, outrageous. Um, but it's, it's one person, so uh, I have my doubts um, how long it will go on. There are a lot of different um, uh, people uh, actually um, uh, pushing pretty hard to him. Um, I have my doubts. Um, I think he's uh, what he's what he himself uh, wants to achieve with it is is uh, fantastic. Oliver, thank you very much. We yep. have to run to the airport, so okay. that's why I come. Okay. And I, I would like to special thanks Oliver because he came in the morning from Germany, and he is now flying back to Germany. He just came for this workshop. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And we met with him last week. And second claps for that. Thank you very much, Oliver. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great workshop.